We're going to continue the teaching we started some time ago, purpose, then the vision and plan. We have a purpose is our destination, why we're here. People are wondering often, what's God's plan? Why am I here? And we come up with all kinds of ideas, and it's really very simple, and we had started that, and we saw it. But a purpose, the noun is, the reason for something is done or created, or for which something exists. God's plan for you came from his purpose. And that's important because we have to know what God's purpose was in having man arrive. And the vision, the noun, is the ability to think or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. Our imagination, creativity, creative power, inventiveness. But if you don't know what your purpose is, what can you give vision to? And it says write the vision, make it plain so those that can run with it but if you read all of that in context in the number of chapters, God told him something to then tell the people so they could run with it, the vision. You don't get a vision without the purpose. And you might think your vision is to be whatever you've been called to be, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a carpenter, whatever it might be. And so you figure that's what it is, and you base, think that's your purpose. And then when it doesn't turn out the way you want, it doesn't work. Nobody's purpose on here, on earth, is to be whatever career calling you might think you have. If you're an entrepreneur, if that's what God's plan is, that's not your purpose, to be an entrepreneur. God's purpose, I believe, for us, when you look at what he did and who he is, God's purpose for us, why did he create man, was because he is love. And he wanted to be able to pour his love out. His purpose was to pour his love into people. He, his purpose was to have a family. And when you realize that God created man for the purpose of pouring his love out, it gives a different perspective. He didn't create us, and I've heard people say he created us for worship. He's, if, if our purpose, if God's purpose was to create us for worship, he is very egotistical. That's not love. And God is love. Yes, we are to worship him. I'm not saying we're not. But he's got all these angels he created, and he could create if he did. If that wasn't enough, that bowed down before him, he could create more and more and more. He is not an egotistical God where we were created just for some purpose to pat him on the back and make him feel good. And in a way, that's pride. God needs me. He needs me because he needs me to worship him. He needed me because he needed to pour his love into me. End of the story for his purpose. Now, his vision and plan, we'll look at, but that was God's purpose. And we all have to realize that God's purpose for me was to pour his love into me. You're not just some speck on this globe. You were intended to receive God's love. And you look at what he all did in the Garden of Eden before he put man in the Garden of Eden. He didn't make, create man and then say, okay, now you better do this and this, and I might give you some seed to sow. And if you do that and are good enough, I'll allow it to grow. He didn't. He gave man everything. And then 
had it all done, and then put man in the garden. Jesus has done everything for us already because of love. So we saw that. We know with God, nothing is automatic. He takes the first step. When we trust him, we respond. Under the old covenant, they had to do something in order to get something. God's already given us everything, and we just have to take a step towards him, believing what he's already done for us. And we've, we saw that Jesus' purpose, and we're not looking at these scriptures, but we've gone over them before, Matthew 5, 17 to 18, Romans 10, 4, Galatians 3, 24. One, he came to fulfill the law. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. He fulfilled it. We're in him. So as far as God's concerned, we've fulfilled it. He is the end of the law. And these scriptures tell us that. And it's the end of the curse. The curse has no authority in my life. Satan has no authority in my life unless I give him permission. Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Jesus became a curse so that I could have the blessing. He redeemed me from the curse of the law. I'm free from the curse of the law. And if any part of the curse of the law comes in my life, it's my fault. Not God. We also saw Jesus' purpose in 1 John 3, 8 to 9 was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 1 to 2, his purpose was to have, bring many sons to glory. And in Luke 4, 16 to 21, is, that is the vision or the plan that Jesus worked to bring many sons to glory. So let's look. And this was already mentioned this morning. Let's go back to Ephesians 5, chapter, one, chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians 5, 1. Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. The other King James translation says, Be followers of God as dear children. Notice, it says children. We are his children. You can tell a child's parents by checking their DNA, etc. Well, my spiritual DNA, I have the DNA of my heavenly father. I'm his child. So that's our purpose. I believe to be an imitator of God is our purpose. Now, God has a plan, a path. But I believe everything stems from that purpose to imitate him. Why? Because, one, I'm his child. Children imitate their father. Two, I'm in Christ. And Jesus' purpose was to do what the father sent him to do, which was to destroy the works of the devil. That's the plan we have. Romans 12, 1 to 2. And here's working the plan. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you, present your bodies. Don't expect God to present your body. You do it. A living sacrifice. He doesn't want you dead. He's not going to take your will away from you and turn you into a robot. But it's something we have to do. It's acceptable to God, and that's just merely our reasonable service. Next verse. So once you do that, you're not conformed to the world. You're not going to let your body do things the world does. You're not going to get into immorality. 
that the world does. When you realize your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit and you present it as a living sacrifice, it will stop you from living the way of the world, walking in immorality. And do not be, again, conformed to this world. Once you've presented your body, taken care of your body, you can now not be conformed to the world one way only by renewing your mind. But if your body is in control, your feelings, your emotions, your five physical senses are in control, you will not be able to renew your mind. Your body, your emotions will not allow you to that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's go to, well, let's go to Mark 9, 35. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last, shall be last of all and a servant of all. Chapter 10, Mark 10. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Next verse. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. And that slave actually in the original, it says servant. Servant. Next verse. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Now you can tell where it says slaves. Keeping it in context, it would be where it says slaves, they put it wrong. It should be, if you keep it in context, it would be servant. But to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We are to be imitators of God. But we have to understand something. When people think servant, they think slave. They are not the same. The meaning of slave, it was one taken against his will and forced to serve. That's a slave. God's not asking us to be slaves. A servant in the Bible times was one who voluntarily, now remember, we saw it, present your body a living sacrifice. That's voluntarily. You voluntarily chose to serve another. We must voluntarily choose to serve and be a servant to those around us in the body of Christ and take our part. So when you read servant in the Bible, it is not referring to being a slave. And we get that mixed up because a slave is ordered and told what to do and forced to do it. God never forces us at any time. He gives us his word, tells us what he wants, and we have the option to humble ourselves and be a servant. So we have to remember that. And when you get into a place where you're trying to control people and force them to do something, are you trying to make them your slave? Are you trying to get them to be somebody they're not? Somebody they haven't, God hasn't called them to be? That's coercion. And really, when you boil it all down, whenever you try and control somebody and make them to be something God hasn't called them to be and mold them and make them this little robot, you're trying to force them to be a slave. And we are in this enlightened society. We don't like to think slave. There are many ways of making a person a slave against their will. And coercion in the body of Christ must not exist. Anywhere.
by anyone. There are leaders, but coercion is wrong all the time. Philippians 2, 4 to 11. Philippians chapter 2. We looked at this as a bit of a review. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's serving in the body of Christ. Why are you an usher? I hope no usher here is doing it because they want people to pat them on the back and tell them how great they are. They're here to serve, looking after the interest of the rest of the congregation. In children's ministry. And unfortunately, there are not enough dedicated children's workers serving the children. And Jesus was very high on children being ministered to. People, that's one of the highest callings, I believe, that you can do is to be involved in children's ministry and serving the children. It's high. The disciples tried to chase the children away. Jesus said, let them come. Let them come. Faith as a child. So think twice. If you maybe have a feeling, maybe I should be in children's ministry, but oh, back there I'm hidden. You can always listen online later. But it's vitally important how you treat and how you think of any ministry in the church, and especially ministering to children. It's serious. We're to be servants to those children. We're to be a servant to our own children. Amen. Continue with this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now this is the mind we're to have. So we know what our purpose is. To be an imitator. And in order to be an imitator of God, of Jesus, we have to have this mind in us. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself. Notice God didn't make him. Of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant. And coming in the likeness of man. He chose that himself. You must choose yourself to be a servant. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself. Who humbled Jesus? I've heard people say, oh, Lord, humble me. Oh, Lord, break my will. Well, you pray that, you've opened the door to the devil. He will do everything he can to break your will. God doesn't want broke people with broken wills. He just wants their, your will to conform to his will that he has for you. He's not going to humble you. You must humble yourself. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, sometimes we have great plans of what we should do or want to do. But God has a better plan. We have to find out his plan. God says, I know the plans I have for you. We have to know his plan. Therefore, God highly exalted him. Who exalted Jesus? Why? Be he humbled himself. You don't exalt yourself. And given him a name which is above every name. Now, we've got to see that. When we humble ourselves. We become born again, and we've been given the name of Jesus. Not because of anything we've done, except we've humbled ourselves. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. We're to be an imitator of God. We humble ourselves. When we speak the name of Jesus, every demon in hell, on earth or in the heavenlies, must bow its knee. 
Not because of us, but because of Jesus. That's where we get mixed up. We think it's because of us. We do something or other, and now we speak the name, and we expect it to happen. It's not because of us. All we have had to do was humble ourselves. Become a servant, humble ourselves. Be a servant to God. Choose. And when we speak the name of Jesus, it, whatever you speak the name of Jesus to, it must change. Now, I don't know about you all, but I've said things and spoken the name of Jesus and have not seen the results. One of two reasons. One, I really didn't believe it or I was lacking information. Or two, I still continued to look at the natural instead of seeing in this realm of the spirit where when I spoke that, Satan's knee had to bow. Amen. We're looking at the realm of the spirit of those in heaven and earth and under the earth. Verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. After the rapture of the church, at the end of the age, after the tribulation and all hell's broken loose on earth, every knee is going to bow and declare Jesus is Lord. It's a good idea to do that today. Yeah. Don't wait until then. <laughs> then it'll be too late. Today is the day for you to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Today is the day. Glory. Once again, 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9. 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Therefore, humble yourself. I just want this to be so clear. We're sometimes asking God to do something that he's told us to do. And once again, we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Don't humble yourself just under anything. Don't humble yourself under Satan. Don't believe his lies. But believe the word of God. And what he's asked us to do. When you do that then he's in a position to exalt you in due time. The same as he did with Jesus. Jesus humbled himself. God exalted him. You humble yourself. God exalted him. And one way of humbling yourself is casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. God's smarter than we are. But too often we instead, we cast our care on him. And then, and I used to, do this, I would cast my care on him, and then I would stop and figure out, okay, God, how are you going to do this? And I would list off a few ways he could do it. I remember many years ago, I heard Keith Moore say, this was an example he used. And I don't, maybe you all know it, but anyway, I still think about it occasionally when I try and get back into figuring out how God's going to solve it. But you have this problem, this situation, and it's like you're looking for a file. And so you open your file cabinet and you go through where it should be. It's not there in the right alphabetical order. So you start at the A's and you go through every file and you don't find it. So then you start from the back going through every file and you don't find it. And he says, when we come up against a situation, that's what we do. We go through the files in our mind trying to find the answer and figuring God's going to answer it according to one of those. He says, it's none of them. The file's not in there. We don't have the answer. God doesn't always do everything the same way. Go to him. He's got the file, and he'll reveal it to us. Casting all your care on the Lord because he cares for you, and he will then tell us what to do. Next verse. Be sober. Be sober. Don't be wild. Don't let your mind go. Be vigilant. Why do we cast our care on the Lord? Why do we first of all humble ourselves and then he'll exalt us? He'll exalt us over whatever the enemy has brought against us, whatever problem. But we have to be sober, keeping our mind fixed on the Lord. Be vigilant, be aware, watch. 
Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He cannot devour you unless you walk in pride and don't humble yourself. Unless you do not put the word of God forth first and you try and exalt yourself. Trying to figure out the problems. Instead of casting your care on him and letting him look after it, now you've opened the door to Satan. So those are things we're to do. But here is a vision. See, we do those things regarding imitating God, humbling ourselves, etc. But let's look at John 14. Here, I believe, is the vision. We've already found out the purpose to imitate God. But this is something that is God imitated. Imitating. Right here. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Number one. Speak only the Father's words. Please put that back up. Speak only the Father's words. Number two, a humble person always realizes that it's the Father, the Holy Spirit in you that's doing the work. Always. You don't do it on your... You know, we talk about the authority of the believer. Our authority is to get, get born again. We have to choose. But when we speak the name of Jesus, when we do the works of Jesus... It's his authority in us. It's his authority that's going to change things. Next verse. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works. Next verse. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me... If we're believers in Jesus, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do because I go to my Father. We are to do the works of Jesus. And, and I've heard so many people, they argue, what are the greater works? What are the greater works? Look, get the other works done. Do the works of Jesus. Then consider the greater works. Let's not try and start with greater and try and figure out what they are. We are to do the works that Jesus did if we believe in Jesus. Amen. If we believe in Jesus. That's being an imitator. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We are not to take the glory. When the Holy Spirit works through us, we're to make sure we give the glory to Jesus. We are to ask anything in his name. We are asking based on what Jesus has already done for us, not asking on what we want him to do. Has he healed the sick? So we're not asking him, but he said in our authority to lay hands on the sick. If you ask anything in my name, in Jesus' name. Well, we already saw where the devil has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. So when we believe in Jesus, we know his authority and we know the devil has to bow its knee. Now we're talking about the works he did. If you love me, keep my commandments. And whoa, all of a sudden, people are in two. All the old covenant commandments. And there were 600 and some. So if I love God, if I love Jesus, I will keep all his commandments. You know, if I tried that, the rapture would come before I'm done. And if you break one, it says in James, you're guilty of breaking them all. Let's have that scripture back up, please. If you love me, keep my commandments. His commandment was to do the works that he did. Read it in context. 
Next verse. Jesus answered. Is that as far as we went with that? Verse 15. Did we have verse 15 already? We might have. Okay. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay. I, um, let's, yeah, go to, um, we're asking according to his will, asking, trusting. It was through the anointing power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus' miracles occurred. We're going to look at it. We have that same Holy Spirit and that same anointing. It was through the anointing, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Is Jesus with you today? Amen. Are you anointed with the Holy Spirit? Yes. Then you're to go about doing good as Jesus did, being an imitator of him. It's not by might, that Zechariah 4, 6, is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I believe without the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you're not going to walk in the realm of the miraculous. Jesus didn't. Jesus needed to be anointed, filled to overflowing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit before he went about doing good and healing all. So I believe you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God's plan is for us the same miraculous deeds that Jesus did to flow through the believers. Jesus said, the works that I do shall ye do also. We've got to expect it, church. Amen. We've got to expect it. In verse 14, we saw that Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments does not cause us to love God. But when we keep his commandments or keep his word, it's just because we love him. Keeping his commandments doesn't cause us or produce loving God. But when I love God, when I love my heavenly father, because he first loved me, because of that love, I will keep his commandments. Because of that love, I will live a moral life. Because of love. Because of what he's done for me. And Father is going to send the Holy Spirit. So now, let's go to verse 23. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will what? The other place, just before that he said commandments. So it's commandments and word. When you hear law, a lot of times it's the word of God. So if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If we love Jesus, we will keep his word. Now I know we miss it. We all miss it. But it's one thing to miss it and, and at the time just miss it. It's another to think, well, I'm just going to do this regardless and God's just going to forgive me. Well, you're already forgiven. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Think about this. Jesus, by Holy Spirit, has made his home with you. Well, when somebody comes into your home, invites themselves in, and you see that in Revelation as well. Well, Jesus said, I'm knocking open, I'll come in and sup with you. Who supplies the food? The one that comes in. He's going to look after us. Next verse, keep going, let's go. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. Holy Spirit is here to teach us all things. Psychology, psychiatry, sociology, anyology out there will not be your teacher, should not be your teacher, should not tell you the way to go. Holy Spirit will. This is why we can cast our care on him because he'll tell us what to do. He will teach you all things. What all things? All things that you need to know. Amen. To walk out in victory, to fulfill the plan of God and bring to your remembrance things that I have said. We need Holy Spirit. How God anointed, Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. We're to go about doing good because God is with us. Oppression comes from the devil. Now we might say, and often we look at it, and I've heard people say, well, yeah, that's this person, and this is how I was raised, or in a dysfunctional family, or didn't have money, or all kinds of things. I was just dealt a bad hand. I want to show you we've all been dealt the same hand. Um, the other night, Shauna Bren's wife was over and we were playing crib. I don't know if any of you know play crib. But anyway, it's cards and you peg and all of this stuff. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, people say that they were just dealt a bad hand. And when you play this game, somebody deals. Whatever card you get, that's what you get. I mean, you're stuck, and this is with any card game. It doesn't matter how good you are, and I know there's some, some skill as far as parts of the game, knowing what to keep, what to, how to pay, whatever. But then the card is cut. You might have four in your hand, but if the right card is cut, suddenly you have 16. What did that have to do with you? Nothing. You see, that's the way it is in the world. It's by chance. And suddenly that person wins by a large amount because the other person, when the cards were dealt out, got very little. You know, they maybe would get a four in their hand. And we have somehow thought that's the way life is. Well, maybe in the natural realm, that's the way it was. But the moment you get born again, you all have been dealt the same hand, and it's a winning hand. No man is in control of that hand. God deals it. And it's perfect. And we're all on the same level ground. It's what we do with what God's given us. We're going to look at some of the things he's given us. A more better game, I guess, to compare to the way God does things is I don't play chess. To me... It's not a game I could play because you have to sit there quiet and look at it. And I prefer to, if I'm going to play a game with somebody, that means I've got people and I want to visit with them. The same as I, if I'm going to watch sports, I prefer to watch football because there's a long time between plays and I can visit. Hockey, it's just, and there's no time to visit. And I try and talk even to Dave and I'll say something. The only good thing is if it's a recording, we can put it on pause and then I can say something. But it just goes. But chess, you all have exactly the same thing. The same number of whatever you call those things, pieces, and, and all the rest of it. And you have the same number of kings and queens and bishops. And maybe there's an archbishop in there. I don't know. <laughs> and it's what you do with those pieces. That's going to determine if you win. Now, this is a little side issue. That game lost us good friends. I thought they were good. Dave, and the woman and I would be visiting, and Dave and Art would be playing this chess game. Now, he used to sit there and think and think. Now, he was a professor at the university. Dave was an entrepreneur, so obviously his thinking skills should be better 
because he's a professor. But Dave would get tired of sitting there, and I mean, you're supposed to do all this, but Dave could just look at something, look at it, already figure out what he's going to do, regardless. And so he would get up, go get a drink, come and say hi to us while we were visiting the ladies, and then he'd come back, look and see if he moved. He'd sit down, and he'd go like this and move. Well, after a little bit, Dave won. After a few times of doing this, he got so up, not David, Art got so upset, he up, flipped up the game, just got so mad that Dave was so disrespectful <laughs> of him not taking the game seriously. Obviously, Dave won. That's pretty serious, I think. <laughs> and anyway, that was the end of that, and we, there was no more chess matches between them. But when you think about it, that's the way people are. In, even in the kingdom of God, we've all been given the same pieces. And just because somebody has used their pieces listening to Holy Spirit on what to do and the other person hasn't, so they've advanced and moved forward with what God's given them, the other one gets mad and now figures God's got favorites or, well, it's just des predestination after all. You see how stupid that is? I mean, maybe stupid isn't a good word. I know my one granddaughter, we were out for lunch with Peter and Lanny, and Peter said, and she was about four, I guess, that was really stupid. And she went, Mama, Mama, he said a bad word. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't say it at that moment. <laughs> anyway. But it is. Can you see how people do that? We've all been given the same gifts and talents. Now, I know we're called to different things, but let's look at this. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look now at the tools that have been dealt to us, the tools we have. We're all on the same level playing field with the same things once we get born again. Yes, our calling's different. I have not been called to be a doctor. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but Helen was called to be a doctor, and she's thriving in it because she's following what Holy Spirit told her to do. Therein is a difference. That doesn't make her better than me because she's doing what God called her to do and using the gifts God's given her. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We're talking about the tools. Then God said, let us make man in our image. So we were made in the image of God. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Satan is a creep. We have authority over him. We're in God's image. When Jesus rose and we make Jesus Lord of our life, we're back in that image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created in him. Male and female, he created them. There are two sexes, male and female. You don't need to get confused about it. God created you in your mother's womb. And he decided if you're female or male, man or woman, end of story. And if you think you're anything else, Satan has deceived you, and you have to get your mind renewed. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And I believe the multiplication in the body of Christ should be souls being saved. Keep going. Where do we go next? No, okay, now we're going to chapter 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being or a living soul. And in the Hebrew, it means a speaking spirit like God. That's how man was made. He was made a speaking spirit like God. And the breath that God breathed into him was his spirit. He became a spirit being. 
When we get born again, the Spirit of God takes out the stony heart and he comes in and gives us a heart of flesh. Once again, we have the breath, the life of God in us. We have his life in us. The same that happened in the Garden of Eden. Verse 8, I guess. What verse are we on? The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. Next verse. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden to tend and to keep it. And we'll get to a scripture later, but we are here in the earth to tend and keep it. God has not changed his original plan for man. In Hebrews 11:9. And 17, it says, God is faithful to his promise, to his word. Whatever he's promised in the word, he is faithful to to keep. As I've said before, it's not that he's faithful to us because we can come up with some crazy ideas. And if God is faithful to us, then he has to be faithful and allow these crazy ideas to come forth. He's only faithful to his word, what he has promised. Amen? So one of the things he promised, Galatians 3, 13 to 14, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We have been promised to be redeemed from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Next verse. That the blessing, here's a promise. He's faithful to this. When we make Jesus Christ Lord of our life, we have the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. When we're in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. When we get born again, we receive the promise. We receive the promised Holy Spirit. And when we are born again and we ask Jesus to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is one of our tools to do the works of Jesus. Because how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Same Holy Spirit. We get anointed with the Holy Spirit. We're to go about doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the devil because God's with us and he's in us. He's in us. Glory to God. So that's one of the tools. Let's look at Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power. How many of you really realize that power that you received when the Holy Spirit came on you. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. They were doing the works of Jesus that we're commanded to do because we have the power of Holy Spirit in our life. One of our tools. Now, I told you we're all on the same playing ground, right? Level. We've all been given the opportunity to be baptized in Holy Spirit. Because somebody says, I don't believe in Holy Spirit, or I believe the baptism with evidence of speaking in tongues has passed away. You've just allowed the person that's filled with Holy Spirit to take, move their little piece one closer to victory. And I'm not talking about whether you go to heaven or not. We're talking about doing the works of Jesus, walking in victory and power in this earth. Therein is the difference. And we have to realize we are not the power source. It's not my power. It's Holy Spirit power. Remember, we're to be humble. And here's another tool, what we have to get the job done. Mark 16, 14 to 20. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. 
Don't be in a place where he's going to have to rebuke you for your hardness of heart and for your unbelief. He said the works that he did, we will do, and we will receive power. End of story. Just believe it. He said it. Just believe it. And he said to them, here's what we're to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not man's doctrines and traditions. The gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. The grace of God. His willingness to do for us. And we hook in by faith. He who believes and is baptized this is not water baptism, will be saved because you don't get saved by water baptism. You get that baptism is when we believe we're baptized into Jesus. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And people have used that for water baptism and it's wrong, wrong, yeah. wrong. Yeah. The only way you get condemned is if you do not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now here, so we've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and as a result, because of that tool, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, in Jesus' name, in his authority, we cast out demons. In his authority, we speak with new tongues. And we can take up serpents. If something bites us, it's not the practice of charming snakes. <laughs> and if they drink any deadly thing, remember, you've got to pray over your, everything you put in your mouth. But if something is bad in that, and we've prayed over it, it will not hurt us. Glory to God. We'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Not maybe, they will. And when we pray for the sick, we believe they recover. And if they walk out and they haven't recovered, we just know that they're recovered. And by the time they get to their car or wherever, if it's at work, by the time they get home, IJ, by sharing the work, have you seen miracles with people that you've prayed for being healed and things happening at, from work? Hallelujah. Was it instantaneous? You saw it? Did you believe? See? Just believe. That's what the word says. Then after that, the Lord had spoken to them. He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Notice. He's already at the right hand of God. We don't exalt him. Jesus was exalted. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working. And that's them. It should be in italics. The scripture actually says the Lord working with and confirming the word. Through the accompanying signs. When we preach the gospel. When we tell them how much Jesus loves them. When we tell them what the Lord has done for them. Those signs will follow us because we're speaking the word. So they're actually following the word. If the Lord is working with us and we're doing what he has not called us to do, he is not going to confirm us. That's pride. He confirms the word. So we have that. Here's another thing we have, a tool to get the job done. Acts 28, 18 to 20. We're being an imitator, fulfilling our purpose. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord, nope, M Matthew, I apologize. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me. Who's got the authority? Who's got all authority? Who's got authority over Satan? Jesus. In heaven and earth. Now. Next verse. Go therefore and make disciples. Make a disciple, a follower of Jesus, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Next verse. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He has all authority. But we're to go in his name. And when you look in the original, when it's talking about name of Jesus, it's referring to authority. In that culture, name was a certain, they had a certain place and it gave them a certain authority. An authority in the family and wherever they might be. So we are to go in the authority of Jesus. 
declaring his name, and it's because his authority. When Satan hears the authority and the name of Jesus, he must bow his knee. So I don't have authority. My authority is to choose, and I've got a free will, but to do what God's asked. I use my personal authority to speak the word, but it's Jesus' authority that brings it to pass, not my authority. And I know to say the believer's authority isn't really wrong, and, but it's really me walking in the authority of Jesus. And I know Brother Hagen used this example of the police officer holding up his hand and all these semi-trailers and everything, and he would say his authority. But you see, that police officer has no authority. They wouldn't stop, except they know what's backing him. And the only reason Satan stops and sickness and disease has to go because he knows what's backing me. When I speak the word of God, he doesn't know it's me. He just, as far, because it's in the realm of the spirit, as far as he's concerned, it's Jesus. Hallelujah. So now we all have work, employment. And here's what it says. We've got all those tools. We're to do the works of Jesus. But let's look at Luke 19, 12. To start. Therefore he said a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This is referring to Jesus. Next verse. No, let's do Luke 19, verse 13, please. Luke 19. Okay, we'll go down to um, verse 13. So he called the ten servants. Notice, they're servants, not slaves. And delivered to them to delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, do business till I come. The other one is King James says, occupy till I come. We are to, put it up please. We are to do business in the marketplace, occupy in the marketplace, till Jesus returns. So there is, and so he says, to do the works that I do, sometimes we think those works are only to be done in church, in the marketplace. And that's why I, when you get to this, this is why I mentioned IJ. She has been doing that in the marketplace. She has been doing business occupying in the marketplace. So these servants represent the followers of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus does not simply mean you either receive him or reject him. It's an active commitment to serve him, to be a servant which is our choice. Keep going, please. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man over us. Now keep going down to verse 24, please. No, verse 22. I apologize. Go back up to 22. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Now we know that's not talking about Jesus. He's not austere, austere but that man was given a talent. He was given a gift, and he buried it. And often we might be working, and God's called us to whatever vocation we might be doing, but we're there to occupy, to do business, to be that witness, and we've got the tools, but we bury the gift we have, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Next verse. 
Why then did you not put my money in the bank that my, at my coming I might have collected it with interest? You see, what he had was taken from him. You see, that wasn't his money to use as he wanted to. The talents and gifts that have been given to you are God's. He's given them to you to use. Verse 24. And he said to those who stood by, take the money from him and give it to him who has ten. God considers it a failure. Now he's not holding it against us, you know, all the rest of it. But it's a failure when we don't use what he has given us and use it to increase his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And I know people see that and think it's unjust for God to take the one from the one guy that didn't use it and give it to the one with ten. The Lord did not give us, in this case, that money for their benefit and their welfare. It was strictly given to them to advance the kingdom. The gifts God's given us, and we looked at Holy Spirit, laying hands on the sick, all of those tools, he has not given them to us for our welfare. You see, Jesus has already healed us. We're to walk in that. But they are for ministering to others, for advancing his kingdom. That's the purpose and the vision to do. The one who produced 10 was the most productive. So when you just, we think, well, that wasn't fair of God, but you stop and think. If you've got employees and you need someone to be in charge and look after everything, are you going to give it to the least productive or the one that has shown the most promise and the most production? Well, if we're that smart, don't you think God is? You see, here's the thing. The world is turning us, and we have to like, keep hold of that principle. We've got to keep going, because the world is turning us to communism and socialism, where it takes from the rich to give to the poor, and they don't have to do anything for it. Be aware of that, and don't allow yourself to fall into that trap. That's not God's system. That's not God's system. And we're all on a level playing field here in the realm of the spirit. And it's us, up to us what we want to do for it. There's no benefit or stewardship involved if you become a place where you're slothful and you're rewarded for it. And someone who is productive has it taken away. Eventually the productive person will stop. And that's the world system today. We have to guard ourselves against it. It's in the workplace. We have to realize it. And we have to make sure that our children at school aren't brainwashed with it. Because it's so easy to say, well, look at this. I mean, they're so poor. And you've got so much. Let's tax the rich and give it to the poor. And keep taking from the rich to give to the poor. Now, the church is supposed to look after the poor. We are in, in the church family. But we have to be very aware of those things. Don't fall into that trap. We are to occupy until he comes, spreading the kingdom, laying hands on the sick, doing the works of Jesus. Luke one twenty eight. And this is what we have to say when we read what Jesus told us to do. The works that I do shall ye do also. Luke 1, 38, please. And Mary said, Behold, and this is what we should say, Behold the maidservant, the manservant, servant, freely. You're doing this out of choice of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We have to say that. Jesus said, the works that I do shall ye do also.
And greater works shall you do because I go to my Father. I have endued you with power from on high. I have given you my name. Humble yourself. Cast your care on the Lord. Say, be it unto me according to your word, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Please stand. <clears throat>